everybody out there. Thanks for joining us. We are now live with Brass Tacks Hard Facts Live tonight with Chief Dave McGrail. So we appreciate everybody tuning in. Uh, tonight we are going deep on standpipe operations. Uh, that's a very wide net to cast, but um, we've got the guy that, uh, you know, literally wrote the book on the topic. We we're very honored to have Chief Dave McGrail the Denver Fire Department with us tonight to talk about standpipe operations. So thanks for joining us. Uh, just a couple little quick housekeeping things. If you happen to miss part of this, if you're at the firehouse, you catch a run, it will be on YouTube tomorrow. Um, if there's somebody you wanna show this to, maybe oncoming shift tomorrow, let them know, hey, this is up on YouTube. You can always go back and rewatch any of this on the Elkhart Brass Facebook page. Um, Give us some love on the socials. If you're watching it with your crew, um, send us on Instagram. We'll give it a post up, um, do a watch party, spread the word. Tonight's going to be really good. So um, again, I'm Chris Martin. I'm going to pass it over to Jerry Herbst. Hey, Jerry. Hey, folks. Welcome. welcome back. And uh, and a big thank you. Um, the engagement on, on the past uh, live episodes has been tremendous. Um, a, a lot of, of company level activity and department level activity after the fact, and we appreciate you sharing that information like Chris, Chris said. Uh, a couple of things that have come up since the last week, uh, a shout out to Dominic, a, a friend down in Texas. Uh, was, we were talking about uh, testing equipment and we had mentioned in, in one of the past segments, uh, if you're having problems getting your hands on flow meters and that type of stuff, reach out, just IM me, uh, you can get me through Facebook and I'll hook you up with one of our regional managers. Uh, we understand that equipment can be pretty expensive. We're happy to loan it out to you if you're gonna set up some trials and do some testing. Um, so again, welcome. Uh, I, I, I'm proud to introduce a good friend, Dave McGrail. And uh, Chief, as, as Chris said, you're, um, uh, the, the foundation of knowledge uh, going back years in this subject matter, um, both high rise and standpipe operations. Um, if you would give us a little quick bio of yourself and and tell us why you 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 drove to this as a discipline so deeply. Okay. Well, first off, thank you, uh, Chris and Jerry, for the invitation to be a part of this. Uh, I'm flattered and honored that you guys would have me be a part of this. So. Thank you very much, and certainly to all the firefighters and other folks that have joined us tonight online. Thank you all for, you know, uh, being dedicated and engaged to our great profession. Um, Jerry, I uh, on February twenty uh, second of this year, I I uh, finished thirty eight years and started into my thirty ninth year in the fire service. Um, I've been with Denver for thirty three years, and starting my thirty fourth year with Denver. Uh, prior to coming to Denver, I worked for a very good organization, the Aurora Fire Department, and that's basically the city that's uh, on the eastern side of the Denver metropolitan area and actually borders Denver. Um, but uh, so, yeah, just uh, been one of the lucky guys that stood in the long line and was uh, lucky enough to get hired with some divine intervention uh, on the job and into this profession. Um, you know that my, my father was on the job. My father worked on DFD for 42 years, and that was certainly a huge catalyst for me in, in terms of my interest. It, I, when people ask me, I tell them, you know, I, I can't remember a time ever when I didn't want to be a fireman. I wanted to be a fireman uh, from, you know, uh, from my earliest recollection of being a little boy. I just, my mom would say, uh, to me and my brothers want to go by and visit your dad at the firehouse and I'm in the car. And so it's always what I wanted to do, um, specifically on the high rise stuff. Uh, you know, my dad was a downtown Denver firefighter and, uh, like you two guys, um, we'll take any fire. We'll take a dumpster, a car fire, a house fire, whatever. And those are the ones we get that are high frequency. Um, the, uh, commercial building fires and high rise fires, a little bit less often, but for whatever reason, I was always very intrigued with, with high-rise buildings and the potential of those operations and so forth. And then watching my dad as a downtown Denver firefighter, that was my dream to uh, follow in his footsteps and hopefully work in some of the same places that he worked, which I've had my opportunity to do that and it's been fantastic. Um, so fast forwarding, got on the job in 82 and then got on the Denver job in 87. 
1991, Jerry, I think was a, a pivotal, pivotal year for me in terms of the high rise thing. Um, when I talked to most firefighters uh, in 1991, I was approaching, I had nine years on the job, so I was closing in on that 10 year mark. And when I talked to a lot of my colleagues and friends, a lot of guys would agree that, uh, you know, about 10 years on the job for most firefighters, you start feeling like maybe you're starting to understand what you're doing. You have a little bit of experience. Maybe you're starting to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And that was certainly my case. I was like, uh, I was very fortunate. I was assigned to our rescue company as a firefighter. We were going to a lot of interesting and valuable incidents, uh, extrications, fires, so on and so forth. And in 1991 on uh, Halloween, October 31st of 1991, we went to a fire in a building in South Denver called the Polo Club High Rise Fire. And, um, just when you think you you have a handle on what's going on, you get humbled because you go somewhere and as they as they say, you don't know what you don't know. And at the Polo Club High Rise Fire, we went there and the chief assigned us to to stretch a two and a half backup line on the fire floor. The first line wasn't working. Um, keeping in mind this was a red residential high rise. There was an atrium in the building that contributed significantly to the fire. And the things that I remember clear as day like it happened yesterday is when we walked into the lobby of that building, uh, after we got our assignment and we got our two and a half, we started in, I had never been in that building before, but I looked up and it was an atrium, uh, similar to like your embassy suites hotels. You can look up and, yeah. and see all the, mm -hmm. the open hallways, if you will. And I remember seeing this massive amount of blue fire and flame, literally blue, uh, Coming out, I didn't know the location, but what turned out to be this apartment 702 with the, the door to the apartment is open and fires just blowing out into the atrium. And it was fierce. And, and the first thing that I thought of based on the experience that I had is this is a natural gas fed fire, what's going on here, so on and so forth. Uh, long story short, that was a, a, a significant wind-driven fire before I knew the term wind-driven fire. I had no idea about that. The atrium contributed to it. It was a lot of the science that we know, know today was going on that day. Cold outside, warm inside, prevailing wind out of the north, all of those sorts of things. Um, so as we went up and we started our attack, uh, we had a two and a half. Um, the stream looked good. The, the nozzle reaction felt like we had good water coming out of there. The initial hand line was operating next to us. Um, shortly thereafter, a second two and a half is in place. So there's three hand lines at the door to what was, you know, apartment 702 in this building. Well, we're not making any impact on this fire. And it, as it turns out, and, and you'd find out a whole lot more hindsight being 2020, it was a 750 square foot condo. And uh, it was just a pure wind driven fire. But there was a point in the operation, and I know we're not supposed to do this as firefighters, and we're certainly, certainly not supposed to admit it to any of the firefighters that we work with, but there's a point in the operation where fear started to set in a little bit with me because I'm like, this isn't going out. Uh, we're, we're not making any advancement. And unlike a, a standard issue house fire or ground-based fire operation, one of the things that went through my mind at the time is that we, uh, I, um, we're a long way from being okay. So not like you can back up a couple of feet and bail out of a window and maybe have a sprained ankle. We were, we were deep into this building. Uh, we couldn't see anything. We'd made several turns. Uh, at the time, our rescue company was using one hour air cylinders. So we operated in there for a long time, but we were simply not having an impact on that fire. Um, as the operation continued, one of the senior guys said, let's breach the wall in 704. That was the third two and a half. They breached the wall. With the wall breach, they were able to get water in there and simmer it down. We were able to make the push continue into the apartment and, and uh, finally extinguish it. Went to a third alarm. But wow. that was a huge education for me because I thought I knew a lot. I thought I had a lot of experience. I thought high-rise buildings were cool. I thought how cool it would be to fight a high-rise fire. I'd been to some minor fires and incidents in high-rise buildings, but this was the real deal. And when it was all said and done, I, I, I just realized how much I didn't know about how high-rise firefighting. That um, 
coupled with the one meridian high rise fire in February of the same year. Uh, and with one meridian plaza, as you know, and, and Chris, you know, uh, as well as I do, one of the big lessons from there was the PRVs. Mm -hmm. yep. And when I first heard PRV, when the information came out about one meridian plaza, what's a PRV? <laughs> okay. What's PRV stand for? Um, and as you dive, dive deeper into that, do we have PRVs in my city? And yep, we sure do. And are the PRVs in my city properly set, so on and so forth. But one Meridian Plaza in Philadelphia, February of 91, and then Polo Club High Rise Fire in Denver, uh, October of 91. Uh, that was kind of a catalyst for me in terms of, uh, geez, I, I need to learn a lot more about high rise firefighting because uh, you don't know what you don't know. And I'm tr starting to find out I don't know a lot about it. So. Uh, one of the things that did occur from the Polo Club high rise fire is I did do a, uh, a a fire story about that in Fire Engineering Magazine. And um, so once again, the same as you guys, one of the uh, principal objectives for us in our profession is to share with other firefighter firefighters what's going on, what we've learned, and trying to share from what was learned at, at that fire is, is what I did. And that article was published. But a little bit of the background, a little bit of the bio, Jerry, and a little bit of what was uh, kind of uh, a springboard or a launching pad to kind of get me to start looking at high rise operations a little bit more deeply. Well, Dave, thanks for sharing that. It, and that's, uh, I'm glad you did. And and for the people that are on that heard that, you know, so, this is the fire service, right? Sometimes the test comes ahead of the lesson um that, that term you, you you just don't know sometimes but you're there so uh you know it's funny it it, it is it's a it's a a very low frequency event but a high probability for error type fire uh and and you uh we're, we're all blessed if, that, that you caught that and and have shared since that point and and it's still due to this day um why don't you uh i know you've got some slides um we're going to be pretty broad with our subject matter. We're not going after any particular episode we did. So, uh, you know, those people that are watching, feel free with some questions. But um, maybe just a general overview from your slide presentation for some talking points, Chief. Okay. That, that sounds like a good plan. Um, I, I guess I would start, and I'll just kind of skip around, and we'll see what the, the, the firefighters that are joining us are interested in looking at and so forth. But... I guess one of the one of the main components to to successful high rise firefighting and so forth is, you know, a good knowledge of the buildings and the systems. And for us, obviously, one of the principal systems is going to be the standpipe system, and hence the title of tonight's program, standpipe operations. Um, the, the the photo that I have on the screen is. Uh, several top shelf firefighters that I have the privilege to work with and do some teaching with. We were at the Mile High Firefighters Conference um, a couple of years ago, and we're in a parking garage, um, and that's where we're going to do our our, our hands-on training. This is it's a good place for anybody that's out there listening. To, if you can get a hold of a multi-story parking garage that's standpipe equipped, it's a great place to do standpipe drills. In the process of, uh, of doing this operation on this particular day, um, one of the things that became apparent real quickly is that um, this particular standpipe system in this building, um, it, it yielded a tremendous amount of lessons even before we started stretching hose. And that was that there were significant components of the standpipe system that were broken or on their way to being more broken. And full disclosure here, this is a standpipe in, in Colorado, in Denver Metro. Um, so there, there is the potential for, you know, freezing and rust and scale and sediment, so on and so forth. Now, I'm, I'm not gonna name the specific location, but I will tell you that the parking garage that we're training in is, is owned and operated by a fire department. And so it kind of dawned on me from this photo and a close up here and so on and so forth that if, if a fire department that owns the building is not really taking very good care of their standpipe system, then what would be the expectation of everybody else out there? So a big ticket item is this, we got to have a plan B and prepare for some sort of system failure with regard to the standpipe. 
Um, and, and this was a good example here. I'll back up a little bit and I, you know, many of our friends that are with us tonight, and certainly you guys uh, know and knew the late Andy Fredericks. Uh, he was a mentor and a friend and a guy that I was able to teach with. And um, he left us with many really good quotes, but one of them that he said years ago that I use in a lot of my pre presentations are, is this, this quote that's on the screen here, standpipe systems are like a big black hole. We put water in one end at the FTC and we hope it's gonna come out where we need it on the 10th floor, the 20th floor, whatever the case may be. Well, that's not always what takes place. And so uh, I think that that's, that's a good foundation for firefighters that are operating in standpipe equipped buildings, high rise buildings is knowing the building, knowing the systems, and then understanding that uh, those systems might fail. And they might not do exactly what you want them to do. We, when we started, Jerry, after your original question, you know, the 1991 February fire in uh, Philadelphia, we learned about PRVs. And in that building, the PRVs in that building were not properly calibrated. And Philadelphia firefighters were faced with um, trying to operate and develop an effective fire stream off of uh, hose valve outlets with PRVs that were giving them extremely low double digit pressures. So, Systems and system failure, I think, would be um, a starting point, maybe a talking point for us. Absolutely. And, you know, along those same lines, I got some other ones here. We've, we've, I've talked about this in a lot of my programs, certainly in my city, and I think this is the case in a lot of cities, the you know, start the starting point is the FTC, and there has been a, a history, an ongoing history in Denver of theft of portions or all of the FTC. The one FTC you see here, the female swivel on the left hand side has already been removed. Um, you got to figure out a plan B. Sometimes the plan B is trying to feed a, a hose valve outlet on a lower floor. What we've discovered over time as well is in the PRV equipped buildings. PRVs are also a check valve, so if you're wanting to backfeed a standpipe system on a lower floor hose valve outlet, if it's a PRV, you can't do it because it's going to shut off on you. Um, went to a fire in this building several years ago. It's a high-rise public housing over in West Denver, but the PRV had been literally stolen right out of the building. And uh, typically speaking, most building managers and maintenance people – I don't think they're really in the mode of checking the PRV and uh, this one was missing and we discovered it literally in the heat of battle at the, the time of a, a fire and we did have a working fire in that building. Um, very good engineer on uh, engine 23 that day. He knew how to backfeed the system. He backfed the system at a hose valve outlet on the first floor. It didn't have a PRV. That's how we got water up to the upper floor to fight the fire. Um, this photo here, I, I got this from uh, an Oklahoma City firefighter. And forgive me, I don't remember his name. And if he's listening tonight, I'd love to give him credit for it. But he, in the process of, uh, of doing a program at the, the Lone Star Fire Conference in uh, Austin one year, a um, firefighter from Oklahoma City came up and said, hey, I got, I got a photo I'd like to show, share with you. And he sh shared this photo with me. And I, I think to most firefighters that look at that freestanding Siamese there, They'd look at it and say, well, uh, everything looks fine there. Let's hook up to it. Let's go to work. Well, uh, this is what was really happening behind the scenes with that one. And so this is a problem that I think firefighters all across our country are encountering, with it, starting at the, 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 the FDC and into the building. And uh, it's something we have to be prepared for. Wherever that system fails, that standpipe system fails, we have to be prepared and figure out how are we going to uh, alter our operations to try and, you know, solve the problem and put out this fire. Yeah, hey, so I'm going to I'm going to throw up a question here real quick that it kind of falls like right in line with what we're talking about. Uh, Joe is asking if, if um, can you uh, discuss uh, problems overcoming uh, hooking of the standpipe, such as having to pump directly in the standpipe if the system is damaged? So you kind of just you hit on that. Can we just kind of explain that maybe a little bit deeper? So basically, I think what you're hitting at is finding a first floor outlet valve and pumping to that and charging the system. But it's it's really important to make sure that's on a PRV because it, it won't work that way, right? Absolutely. And, and let me see if I 
Um, I might be able to find a photo that'll help tie this in while I'm talking here um, and give you some different ideas. But uh, uh, for Joe, um, basically, we're, we're trying to, um, we're, we're going to have to get water into the riser somehow. And obviously, we could have a, a significant uh, discussion on, on, on the standpipe system tonight. I mean, there's, there's many, many questions about this. I'm just putting up a photograph of a hose valve outlet. Now, this hose valve outlet is, is, is in my city. And it was discovered uh, just as we discover things when we're inside pre-planning uh, buildings, when we're on an EMS call and we open up a hose valve cabinet and encourage the firefighters that are watching tonight to always do that. Take every opportunity, every every day, every minute's a, a training opportunity. But this particular hose valve outlet has got a, a Zern brand, a PRV. It's mounted upside down in the hose valve in the in the cabinet in, in in my city most of the hose valve outlets are in cabinets as opposed to the stairwell anyhow this is mounted upside down all of the manufacturers of hose valve outlets specifically the prvs recommend don't mount these upside down because the rest the debris the sediment that sort of thing can get trapped in there and then the 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 prv is not able to move and 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 uh regulate pressure specifically. So this one's upside down, that's a problem. If you look closely, there's a sign that the building apparently has put in there. It's in the cabinet, it says no PRVs on fire protection system. Now we just need them to build a new sign that says except for this one and all the others. <laughs> so I, I don't know why it exists there. I have some speculation why it exists there, so on and so forth, but there's just a whole lot of stuff going on here that can certainly harm us. Now. For, forget about the PRV and forget about that, Joe. Just picture the the hose valve outlet and a bad example, obviously here because it is a, it is a PRV. But let's just pretend that this photo shows a hose valve outlet that is in a PRV. You're going to need some adapters. Um, you're going to want to try and do this on a lower floor. At that fire that I just previously talked about, the engineer stretched three inch supply line, which is a primary supply line in Denver. He stretched that into the building. Um, he needed a, a double female adapter to to hook it up, and then um, from there, um, you know, an elbow is always good, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, then he's going to start back feeding that, and obviously the hose valve outlet that he's trying to feed, he's going to need to um, um, he's going to need to uh, you know open up that hose valve too in the process of pressurizing the line from the pumper to get everything in there and so forth so i'm going to try something here um jerry and and uh chris and, and hopefully it won't mess anything up here but uh i have a specific water supply um program and i want to put that up so that we can answer that question appropriately for, for joe as to what's going on here and, and why it's going on so uh bear with me just a second and i'll bring that one up and we can actually look at that one and, and see what's going on there. Uh, let's see here. Where the heck is it at? Um, so let's see here. Try this one. Okay. So, all right. There it is. So, uh, success if that's coming over okay. Yep, we're good. So, so Joe, um, here I got an actual photograph of a hose valve outlet that is not a PRV. Um, it's a standard hose valve outlet. The, the probably the very primitive um, evolution of, of supplying uh, a standpipe riser at the hose valve outlet would involve there's a double female adapter you see there. Uh, we're using an elbow, and that just prevents a kink and makes it a little bit easier transition, especially out of the cabinet. And then the hose that's hooked up to that is a three inch supply line. Now, once again, this hose valve outlet's gonna have to be opened up. Uh, the pumper's gonna have to pressurize water, uh, you know, into the system. And then it's, uh, we're basically going backwards is, is all that's happening right here. Now, as, as time has gone on, we've learned a little bit more. And one of the things that we now know is that uh, on, on every pumper on my fire department in the, uh, you know, the engineer's brass compartment, there is a clappered Siamese. 
And um, I, I hope this is an Elkhart brand clapboard Siamese. Um, but this one also has a drain valve on it. So in the process of doing this hookup, Joe, if you can hook up the clapboard Siamese, charge the first three inch or whatever supply line you got going in there, charge the first uh, supply line on the one side, the clapboard Siamese is gonna allow you to not have a free flow of water, so on and so forth. Get water going, trying to get pressure to the, the attack team that's up above, getting ready to go to work. And after this is done, now you can stretch a second supply line there. Gives you room to grow in terms of volume and pressure. And then I'll take it a, a step further. Um, and Jerry and Chris, you both, both remember this, uh, and especially you, Jerry, back in the day, um, the frozen female swivel on, an, on a building's FDC, uh, well, I remember one of the solutions when I first learned in 1982, twist the hose seven times, and then you start to thread it on and untwist it, and so on and so forth for the threaded uh, female swivel. Well, a better plan certainly was the, uh, the double male and the double female. And as we evolve, now we understand that we could put a, a, a double, um, a, a clappered Siamese on one of the inlets for a building FDC, this gives us room to grow uh, for a situation where we need more pressure and volume. So I don't know. I hope that that answers the question for Joe, What, uh, how you can backfeed a system. And once again, Joe, just want to reiterate that if that's a PRV, a PRV is also a check valve. And if you try to backfeed a check valve, it's going to close and the water's not going anywhere. So great question. Thank you, Joe. Good. All right, Dave, let's keep, we'll keep rolling on the water supply. I think we're, we'll just, we'll build our system up. So we're at the ground level at the FDC and we'll start playing with the risers, the valves and work our way to hose and nozzles. How's that sound? Okay. That sounds good. Um, I can, I can only specifically speak for my system and the system that I'm in and the fire department I work for. Um, the, the, the first arriving engine company is gonna to go to work on the FDC for the building. Uh, for this particular fire that happened in, in Southeast Denver, uh, engine five arrived first. They went to work on the FDC. Um, this pumper is unmarked right now because it's a reserve that was, uh, engine 24 was using this reserve at the time of this fire. Uh, second new engine company is going to go to work on a hydrant um, and how the hose gets in the street, it might be a a reverse, it might be hand stretched, whatever the case may be, but between engine five that's back at that building and engine 24 that we see here on a hydrant, there's two three inch supply lines. Um, engine 24 is taking water from the hydrant with a five short five inch supply. And then the water is going through two impellers on this pumper as it's being pushed down to the pumper that is at the FDC and goes through two impellers as it goes into the building. So that's our basic water supply evolution from the outside. Now. Working high rise fire, we would want to mirror this with a third and fourth engine company. And um, you know, once again, well, if it's a if it's a Siamese, uh, how is the third and fourth engine company going to get water into a building? Now, modern uh, large commercial high rise buildings in downtown areas, including my city, there might be multiple interconnected FDCs and. Uh, engine companies. I've had fires where where uh, a third and a fourth engine company went to work on a separate hydrant and a separate FDC, and that's just a water supply redundancy. And what we're trying to capture here is we're looking at two pumpers from two engine companies that are supplying water, a primary water supply, into this high-rise building. Well, when any of us go to work at a working house, uh, working house fire, ground-based operation a ground-based commercial building fire, that sort of thing. If it's a working fire, many of our basic tenants are, are, are having redundancies in a secondary water supply. Uh, in the photo that we have on the screen right now, there's just one water supply. As that's a working high-rise fire, we wanna get a second water supply from a second hydrant and to have two separate pumpers, the third and fourth in this case, put water into the building for a working high-rise fire. And once again, the way that we're gonna do that um, is going to be uh, starting here. Uh, if you can picture the first arriving and the second arriving engine companies supplying the inlet to the left and the inlet in the middle and leaving the inlet on the right open for the third and fourth engine company. 
That way we're getting water in from two different sources. And if this fire continues to evolve and it uh, is not quickly controlled, um, then we're going to do this on the inside if we have the ability to do it for a non-PRV building. And between those, if you can see it, uh, we've got five different uh, supply line sources going into the building for, for, for supplying just a, a basic high-rise building that one has one Siamese. Because typically with one Siamese, we think, well, we can supply with two, two supply lines. That's all we can do. Well, we can supply two here, and we can supply three here for a total of five. So this, once again, it's why we have a backup line at Working Fires. It's why we do a secondary search. And the recommendation from your brother here in Denver is uh, a secondary water supply at all of our fires. It's just a little bit more logistically complicated to do it at a high rise fire, but that's how we would try and accomplish that. So does that hey, make sense, Chris? Yeah. Dave, quick question. Um, does, does Denver have uh, any kind of a policy where you stretch from the rig below a certain floor to, uh, to, to bypass any kind of uh, uh, standpipe issues? Yes, absolutely. And, and for our, our, you're talking about below grade type stuff, right, Jerry? No, or, or even on a on a vertical standpipe. If you if you got a fire on three, are you going to go to the standpipe or you're going to stretch right to three from the rig? You're cutting out just a little bit. Can you just repeat the original question? Yeah, it's it's some cities have SOPs where they'll bypass the standpipe on a certain number of floors and stretch right from the rig to the floor below. Oh, okay, so you're talking about uh, upward. Um, you know, I think it depends on the building. Um, I, I certainly think that that ties into, I believe, it ties into really pre-planning your buildings very well. Um, if you remember uh, last year at Age Rock, I had uh, both uh, colleagues and friends, uh, Captain Dave Hagman from Engine 8 and Lieutenant Jeff Larson from Engine 3, talked about a couple of situations and examples at standpipe equipped buildings where they stretch from the pumper. And one of the things that I would bring up here to and, and, and keep me on the right track, Jerry, I want to make sure that I'm answering this mm -hmm. correctly. Um, but to, to emphasize the point, I'll, I'll bring up this right here, because I, I know that our, our, our discussion tonight and our principal topic is, is high rise and standpipe operations. Over the course of time, well, one of the things that I that I thought of and I started using as a um, a talking point and, and an objective in training programs, whenever we can do something from our pumper, we've got positive control. Yep. All right, and the, the positive control uh, it's going on here in this photograph. This is a a ground-based fire at what at the time was a vacant building uh, over in a neighborhood called Baker neighborhood in Denver. Um, a very good engine officer uh, who I had the privilege to work with for many years, um, is still on the job. His name is Mike Garcia, and, and uh, his engine company was the first arriving company. And uh, he did everything that I think a chief officer would want an engine company officer to do. He got the pumper out of the way on the opposite side of the street, uh, they went to work directly on a hydrant so they can maximize that water supply because their pump is on the hydrant. And then they stretched over to the, the fire building from that point. Now, be, this is a corner building and it leaves uh, two street fronts for area apparatus to get in there and, 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 and go to work. So it was uh, just an excellent operation. I, I have the photo in there primarily just to talk about the fact that when we can go to work on a city hydrant with our pumper, with our hose, with our nozzles, with our engineer, We've got positive control. So and here's one of a, the term. a newer pumper in Denver, um, the 1500 GPM, uh, beautiful Pierce triple combination pumper, so on and so forth. Positive control, positive control when we're using that. Um, a city hydrant. Uh, I work in a city that that uh, has a very good water system. Average static pressure is 75 psi. Um, so. Positive control, once again, a city hydrant. And then uh, another friend and valued colleague, retired engineer from our job, uh, his name's Tom Martinez, just was a, an outstanding top shelf professional.
But this is the other piece of that puzzle in terms of positive control. So the, uh, you know, we call them engineers in Denver. I know Ray McCormick likes to bust my chops because they call them chauffeurs in New York and so on and so forth. Motor pump operator, driver, chauffeur, engineer, whatever the case may be. Um, with that and the pumper and the city hydrant and our hose and our nozzles, that sort of thing, we have positive control. So kind of a, a, a long way towards answering the question, Jerry, is for our friends that are listening tonight, if you have a building that you know based on the history of being in there and operating in there that has got a stamp pipe system that is problematic, that is prone to failures, uh, it, it's going to be an issue, pre-plan that building and see if you can get a line off the pumper. Now, that can involve rope bags. It can involve taking hose packs in and dropping hose down the outside of the building. There's any number of ways to do it, uh, but, but pre-plan the buildings where you're going to want to do that. So Great. some of the specifics that I give to firefighters um, – when we're doing training programs is, uh, you know, in, in my corner of the fire service, it is a climate that it's the winters here in Denver are not harsh winters. They're not Buffalo, New York winters. They're not lake effect, snow winters, that sort of thing. But there is a period of time, usually in early January, where it gets a little cold and we we have pipes start freezing in buildings and that sort of thing. But um, I have found at, at buildings that have dry stand pipe systems, sports venues, parking garages, that sort of thing. The, the standard operating procedure typically on our job is to stretch from the pumper or however you're going to do that, use that positive control. Now, obviously, second or third floor in buildings, depending on access, it's certainly not a bad option to think about going off of the pumper. But I guess to ultimately answer your question, Jerry, not a specific uh, when this occurs, do this, but more a guideline for officers to make a decision based on their knowledge of their district and their, their buildings that, hey, this is a standpipe equipped building, but this standpipe is not dependable. We're stretching either interior or we're going to the floor below and throwing a, a rope bag out or we're going to the floor below and dropping out, um, you know, uh, enough of our, our hose from our hose pack to, to get to a three-inch supply from the engineer in the street, that sort of thing. So, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm answering that comprehensively yeah, yeah. enough for you or not but, but very much so and that's what possible, it's, it's if possible it's not a bad thing to 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 use uh to stretch from the pumper um for that positive control now uh we're at a 40 story high rise building and fires on the on the 30th floor yeah it's not going to happen nope. it's not going to happen and and we have to uh I don't want to say we have to depend on the system because we don't want to put all of our, our, our eggs in one basket and say we're going to depend on the system. We're going to try the system, and hopefully it's going to work, but we also have to be, be prepared. And, I, and the, the department I work on is a department uh, that really emphasizes physical fitness in firefighters, and I, I, I really value that, and, and, I, and I think that that's one of, the, uh, one, of the, one of the best qualities about my fire department. There are firefighters that are prepared to climb stairs, and there are firefighters that are prepared to stretch lines upstairs, and there are firefighters that have done that and do that on a regular basis. So an example I have for you, and I'm going to have to find the photo here for you, but uh, had a, a, an engine company in downtown Denver many years ago. Uh, the shift uh, uh, stayed after... Uh, the B shift came on duty at 7.30 in the morning because they all wanted to go down and attempt to drill. Uh, they had 800 feet of 5-inch. They do have 800 feet of 5-inch in their main hose bed. Uh, they are 100-foot sections. So with the four firefighters from the A shift and the four firefighters from the, the B shift, including the officer, officer, engineer, two firefighters, for a total of eight of them, they hand-stretched 5-inch supply line in a high-rise building that we're allowed to train in. Uh, this hand-stretched up the stairs. Um, it was 800 feet of 5-inch. Each firefighter had to load up 100 feet of 5-inch on their shoulder, and then they start going in there and just paying it off their shoulder. Uh, they made it to the 41st floor. They did it in 19 minutes. And uh, it's something I, I just really admire those guys, and I, I'm very yeah. proud that there are firefighters that think outside of the box. Okay, okay, here we are. We're at this 44-story commercial high-rise building. The standpipe's not an option. Now what? No problem. 
we're going to stretch from the pumper. Now, I'm not saying we would the five inch would be the best to use. Uh, we didn't charge it. We wanted to be invited back to the building. <laughs> we, we, there, there are issues. It has to be policed. There has to, you, you've got to, uh, in the process of charging something like that, there's concerns about kinks. Quite, quite frankly, if we were to do this in a real situation, a three inch hose might be a better option because it's a little bit more manageable in terms of correcting kinks, different things like that. But the point is, uh, I, I am fortunate to work with uh, firefighters on my job that are always thinking about that and, and preparing to, uh, you know, uh, preparing for plan B. And so just some different thoughts on that with regard to the water supply. So. And, and Dave, I've, I've heard that story, too, from the, the same gentleman you're referring to from that certain engine company. I'll say it three in, in the city of Denver. And yes. I think part of it was. Um, two, that this inevitably became a plan at One Meridian Plaza, correct? Where yes. eventually they did start stretching LDH up stairwells. So, you know, the example was, well, how, how easy or hard is that to do? Well, I don't know. Let's go find out and do it, right? Absolutely. And, and uh, so One Meridian Plaza, as, as you guys know, and, and the firefighters that are with us tonight, Many of them probably have studied that, and I would encourage those firefighters that are with us tonight. If you have, if you have a slow moment at the firehouse and you're a little bit bored and you're waiting for the next run or something like that, uh, you know, uh, get on your computer and and uh, you know Google One Meridian Plaza and, and and look at the fire story and look at some of the photographs and and see for yourself uh, and learn for yourself some of the stuff that happened there. But at One Meridian Plaza, this was a uh, 38-story commercial high-rise building down in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, after the fire, you know, there were many years of litigation, so on and so forth, but the building was eventually demolished. There's now a new high-rise building there, and at the base of that new high-rise building in Center City, Philadelphia, is a firefighter memorial with three fire helmets on the memorial for the three firefighters who lost their lives that night from Philadelphia Fire Department Engine 11. Um, but... Uh, Encourage the firefighters to look at that. That fire uh, went on for many hours, and um, er early on, it was determined that you know we're we're not going to be able to get the water that we want uh, for for whatever reason. They they didn't know that it was improperly set PRVs at the time, so on and so forth. But you're right, Chris. They did have as part of their their plan B, C, D, if you will. They did hand stretch five inch supply line uh, from pumpers in the street. Uh, 21 flights in what was a dark stairwell because every system at one Meridian Plaza, 100% of the building systems failed. Firefighters nightmare. Uh, standpipe system, elevators, electrical, 100% of the building systems failed at that fire. So those firefighters did hand stretch five inch supply line uh, to a manifold uh, and uh, to, to create their own standpipe. They, they accomplished that in one stairwell uh, they accomplished that in a second stairwell, and they were in the process of accomplishing that in a third stairwell. This building had three stairwells when the incident commander declared that they were going to go defensive for the fire. And this was many, many hours into the event. But, uh, yeah, that, that that happened in real life. And, unfortunately, Philadelphia firefighters that night were, were confronted with, once again, they were confronted with 100% building failure and... Uh, it was even with all the work that they did and stretching those five inch supply lines, very difficult to overcome that. Once you have large floor plates like in that building that are burning fully involved. Um, real, this would be a quick question that's right on what we're talking about. Rob Fish, our brother from out west, asked, um, and and I don't recall this. Is there any data that you know out there on system failure? Um, he yeah. thought that it was brought up when you're at H Rock, sure. but you know, was there? Sure. What's this brother's name again? What's this brother's first name again? Rob Fisher. Rob. Hey, Rob. Thank you for the question. Thanks for joining us tonight, brother. I appreciate that, and thanks for attending H Rock and remembering that. Uh, you've got a very good memory. Um, you know, I remember, uh, and I can't remember exactly what year it is, but Rob, you probably remember as well. One year before we started our evolution, the, the standpipe system was charged, and on a floor that uh, that my hot team was getting ready to operate on, there was water everywhere, but none of it fit to drink, and we were trying to figure out what was going on. And it was a sprinkler pipe that broke 
inside of a wall. Um, and, and, and that happens frequently. I'm sure you've experienced that. And, and many, if not most of the firefighters that are with us tonight have experienced that. But the key thing here is that a standpipe system is in most buildings, in, in my city and in yours, a standpipe system is a system that pretty much lays dormant for a long time. Now, I know there's tests that are supposed to be done and things that are supposed to be done, so on and so forth. Are they done? Are they not done? You know, that's on a case by case basis. But my experience has been most standpipe systems, uh, most sprinkler piping, most standpipe riser piping to feed firefighter hose valve outlets. If it's a wet system, it's got water in it that probably hasn't moved in years. And then all of a mm -hmm. sudden here we arrive and, and we're going to start moving the water and uh, it's going to, there's, there's going to be failures that's going to, that are going to happen. That happened at H rock uh, one year, a, a different year. Uh, the, the seals on the building's pump failed and there was water all over the place uh, down at the lower level of the building. So that, that's a very good example. My own experience has been this. Um, I would like to tell you that, that, that I've been to thousands of high rise fires and I've seen fire, 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 fire. Just like you, uh, I've seen a lot more smoke than fire. And at high rise and standpipe equipped buildings, just like you, I've, I've seen a whole lot more water than smoke and fire because it's usually the water that we were trying to put into the building and it ends up going somewhere else. Uh, at one specific, uh, it was a working fire in a high rise and uh, our uh, company was feeding the system, the pipes blew apart, and during the process of searches in the building, they discovered that the lower levels were filling up with water big time. Um, I, I've seen that, and Rob, I, I, I don't have specific statistics to give you, I wish I did, but I would say that in, in my own personal experience, that 80% of the time, the standpipe has some sort of a failure. Maybe it's not a catastrophic failure. Maybe we're over to come. Maybe it is a missing uh, um, uh, swivel on the FTC outside, uh, but it, it just happens a lot. It happens a lot. And I think our mindset has got to be such that, you know, what are we going to, what's the worst case scenario? What are we going to do if something happens tonight and this standpipe system fails? Um, and I wish I had specific statistics for you on that, Rob, but you saw it, as did I, as did Jerry and Chris at ATROC over the course of several years there. And fortunately, uh, because of our good friend Kurt Isaacson and his relationship with those folks, they continue to invite us yeah. back. And I, I will um, tell you, Rob, the kind of, uh, and, and you, you, you seen this one too, Chris, but uh, the, the group that I was with on that 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 floor that one year where the sprinkler pipe broke in the wall i mean it, it was actually it turned out to be a very good drill because okay we got to shift gears now now what do we do and now we're finding sectional control valves we're we're moving water we're doing property conservation that's exactly the stuff albeit unglamorous that we as firefighters do on a high frequency basis so it became part of the drill but uh, uh kurt's got a great relationship with those folks but there have been more than one time, and perhaps most years at H Rock, when we are stretching those lines and we're flowing the water, and uh, we're looking around at one another, the instructors that are part of my Denver team cadre, the attending firefighters from all over the fire service and from as far away as Hawaii, and we're looking at one another, and everybody's thinking the same thing, and that is, you know, we've got to be pretty close to reaching the end of our rope here. They're going to tell us to leave the building sometime soon. And thank God for those people because, and thank God for the relationship Kurt has established with them because they continue to invite us back every year, even though damage has been done. And I, and I know he has explained to them, and I, I think that they see the benefit of that, you know, both economically and in terms of the preparation of firefighters with what's going on on Pensacola Beach there. But what Kurt has established and what he's got going there, it's, it's just phenomenal. I, I always say I just I, I wish that there was somehow that, uh, you know, an organization, Jerry and Chris, like yours, Alcart Brass, could 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 bottle, you know, um, um, Kurt Isaacson, you know, like in those little five hour energy bottles. Yeah. Here, here's some Kurt Isaacson for you, so on and so forth. Yeah. And because he has got he's got passion on steroids and I certainly admire the guy and I certainly admire what he does with that. So Rob make, the bottom um, line is, is it, it happens a lot, Rob, and we gotta prepare for those failures. I make a joke, Dave, because you're right. Every, every year 
And this is a system that is tested by us basically every year that 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 fire protection system put at capacity. And every year there's something that there's a hiccup, right? Like you mentioned, the yeah. fire pump or this. Um, and you're right, they let us back. But I, I say this, I go, it is, it's it's the safest hotel on the planet. Absolutely. Because it's the only one every single year the fire uh, protection system is put to capacity and we find a weak spot and improve it. So um, if that could be their new tagline, maybe is, you know. And it's especially safe when all those firefighters are there. Yeah. But until about eight o'clock in the evening and then yeah. things change a little bit after that. But yeah, uh, yeah it, it's a fantastic thing. So. All right. Well, um, I see you've got a slide up there on the, the tetrahedron. We still got We still want to get to um, hose and nozzles. We still want to get to maybe valves. So let's let's hit your tetrahedron here and keep cruising. Well, originally, Chris, I think, as you know, it started out as a, a fire triangle. And this, this using the, the fire triangle as an example, call it a, a standpipe operations triangle. And for, for, for time and brevity tonight, I just went directly to the tetrahedron. And standpipe system pressure is the is the big ticket item. They're low pressure systems. That's the way they've been designed. The fire protection folks who've designed them over the course of 100 plus years uh, have designed them based on the assumption that the fire suppression people, us, are using two and a half inch hose. So that's why we're advocates of two and a half inch hose because the systems were designed for that. When a system is tested, at least in my city, it is tested at the most remote, usually the top roof manifold, two, two and a half, 100 feet, uh, both with inch and an eighth uh, smooth more nozzles. And we're trying to achieve that 500 GPM. Uh, Pre-93, the, the residual pressure would have been 65 PSI. Post-1993, the residual pressure is 100 PSI. But standpipe system pressure. Um, brother and sister firefighters out there tonight, it's going to be low. Okay, that's the way it was designed. Um, the reflex time is huge because it's going to take us a while to get a line in service. When we roll up and that fire is on the 20th floor, we can be we can be the best in the business, but expect a reflex time that could be uh, as much as one minute per flight to your destination. You could have 20 minutes before you get water on a 20 uh, a fire that's on the 20th floor. Modern fuel loads, we don't need to talk about that. We know what's going on there as far as uh, you know uh, more rapid. Uh, heat development, so on and so forth. And then the wind impact, that's uh, that's out there. And that's something we got to be prepared for. Um, debris in the system certainly is a big part of this, no doubt about that. And um, we, we still find that there, I, I think that there's been tremendous movement and tremendous growth across the American and Canadian fire service over the years with regard to to hose line selection and so on and so forth for standpipe operations. But we still do occasionally open up a compartment door somewhere in the fire service. And we find that 150 feet of inch and three quarter that's on a gated Y and has an automatic combination nozzle on it. Well, we, we learned that this, uh, this can be problematic from one Meridian Plaza. So if it's a le lesson that we learned, um, you know, 29 years ago, we we should be applying it, you know, here in the 21st century. So, um, and I'm just going to come out of there and, and see where directly I want to go here. Valves, Chris had asked about valves. Um, so, and once again, uh, based on brevity, what we'll be able to do tonight. In my book, I use the term, and it's an umbrella term, pressure regulating devices. Standpipe system pressure regulating, regulating devices. Essentially, there's two broad types. There's the restricting devices that in uh, most cases can be easily removed. So external restricting devices, left-hand photo, that can be removed. Internal true pressure-reducing valves. And on the right-hand side, there's a photo of uh, the brand name is Zern. And with the Zern valve, and certainly the Giacomini would be um, uh, an example of this as well. They're very large valves, and that's kind of the telltale sign from the beginning that you have a PRV. Um, in my corner of the fire service, the firefighters that I work with and I have been able to discover 10 different types of pressure regulating, develop, re regulating devices in, in my city. So with that, I have to assume that 
that's probably, and, and it's been my experience from, from teaching and talking to firefighters from other jurisdictions, that's what's going on in other jurisdictions as well. Um, whether it's uh, San Francisco or Oklahoma City or, or Boise or wherever it happens to be, uh, that, that's what's going on in those other systems as well. So this is part of that big black hole that Andy talked about and what's going on there. Uh, sometimes when we talk about PRVs, I've got to be careful that I don't completely, because um, because sometimes after a program, firefighters we got to find all our PRVs and get rid of them. Well, the, there's a the PRV is in the building for a well-intended purpose, and and that is to regulate what can be very high pressure down to a safe pressure, so that we can have an effective fire stream with with a safe pressure. So. This is not to scale example of, of, of a high-rise building that exists in my city, roughly a 50-story building. The blue would be a riser. And, and yes, this building has actually a low-rise standpipe and a high-rise standpipe. But I'm just, just trying to give a, a very simple explanation here. Most times, not always, but most times the, the building's fire pump is going to be at the lowest level. When it kicks off, when that building fire pump kicks off, based on the movement of water, based on a, a jockey pump signaling the main pump to kick off, uh, it's going to kick off at a significant pressure, a pressure uh, high enough to get water to the top of that building. It doesn't, it's not like our engineer, it's who, uh, who, who runs our fire pump and they know where the fire is uh, and can pump precise pressure to that location. This is going to be, uh, the fire pump doesn't know where it's at, it's pumping to the topmost outlet. Uh, three, 350 PSI, the tallest building in Denver, in order to get water to the top, you're well into the 400 PSI range to do that. So if, for example, a fire on the sixth floor, we hook up on five, we don't want a 350 PSI. If we've got that, it may blow the hose apart. It might blow the hose, it might blow the nozzle off the off the hose entirely. It might uh, separate the, the, uh, the couplings from the hose jackets so on and so forth. So that's the reason PRVs exist. And if they are properly um, designed, um, installed in the proper locations, properly maintained, tested on a regular basis, they can be valuable to us. But um, we're finding that there's a lot of human error associated with that process. So a little bit on the PRVs there. Talked about this one a little real, bit here. Real quick, Dave. And, and just to recap uh, for anybody, um, if you go to BrassTaxHardFacts.com, we've got several episodes that go deeper on everything we've talked about. I mean, we're, we're crushing it right now. We're already at an hour and we still got a lot to go. But, um, you know, we have a specific uh, video on the four types of valves, how to identify them, how to potentially defeat them. Um, when we talked about problems with hooking them up to the FTC, we've got a video on that. So, again, refresh those and um, we'll keep cruising. But I just want to let everybody know there is kind of more information out there that's pretty accessible on this. So, you know, the, I didn't want to call it an argument, but there is an argument, and sometimes it even becomes a political argument regarding the hose line size for these buildings. Uh, where I try to hang my hat with firefighters is, is that they need to understand, first of all, that the standpipe systems, once again, are, are built and designed and tested uh, around the premise that we're going to be using two and a half and specifically tested with two and a half inch hose. Now, that's not to say that somewhere out there somebody hasn't tested a standpipe hose valve outlet with two inch or inch and three quarter, whatever the case may be, and maybe they've had success. But within NFPA 14 and the requirements on how they're designed and how they're tested, that's where the two and a half originally comes from. Now, I've, I've had um, firefighters, um, some of them very passionate, as passionate as I am about the subject that, that our not not interested in the two and a half of the standpipe operations and many have said to me well you know what we need to identify what buildings in our city have prvs and we need to test those prvs to see you know if they're operating properly well we're talking about you know thousands of standpipe systems and we're talking about tens of thousands of individual hose valve outlets and tens of thousands of individual uh, uh, PRVs, okay? So we had a fire in, in, in this building, and essentially this is four high-rise buildings connected together. What you see on the screen there is the south and the north terrace. Those are buildings that we, you can't reach the top of those buildings with an aerial from outside. 
based on the terracing and the distance and the setbacks and so on and so forth. But essentially, these are four high-rise buildings together. We had a fire here. It went to a third alarm. Uh, one of your guests, Chris and Jerry, from last week, I think it was, Eric Tolan and uh, Brian Brush, you guys had them. Eric was a firefighter at the time on, on DFD Engine 3, and he was the control firefighter at the hose valve outlet. And one of the early transmissions that I got from him was, you know, command from 3 Delta. Um, we have PRVs in this building. We are hooked up to one. It's a Zern PRV. The max pressure we're getting here is 50 PSI. That's all fantastic information. And because they were using the tool that the system was designed for, uh, they were able to develop an effective and uh, effective and safe fire stream to extinguish the fire. Now, there were many hand lines stretched at this fire because a void, the fire got into void spaces, different things like that, so on and so forth. My point to it is this, is, is it would be difficult, if not impossible, in medium-sized and large jurisdictions to truly test every PRV you have. Um, sometimes the opportunity to test it is in the heat of battle, and this PRV gave us 50 PSI. That's, that's what it gave us. But because we went into the building with high volume, low pressure weapons, specifically the two and a half, we were able to successfully combat the fire. So, and, and this is a, a separate photo from a separate building where I was just prowling around. This building had Giacomini PRVs, but this says everything right here. Flow testing is the only method to confirm that outlet pressure and flow are as required. Now, if you look at, at in this same very building, here's a PRV, the brand name's Giacomini. It's upside down, that's bad news, okay? And if all the firefighters are watching, look closely at that right-hand photo. The zip tie, what the zip tie told me is that is how this PRV came out of the, the box when it arrived at this building. And so I'm certain that this hose valve outlet at this location in this building has never been flow tested. Now, as a side note to this, and, and this is just one more thing that adds on to the problems that we'll encounter. Rob, if you're watching closely on this one, you got the PRV here. What we discovered in this building is if you try to open this valve fully, the hand wheel is going to bottom out on the bottom of the cabinet before you can open up fully. So in essence, the hose valve cabinet is a PRD, a pressure restricting device. And that's the stuff that we encounter on a regular basis. Uh, there's the great uh, Alcard Urfa valve, and that is what is going into any new installation in Denver that requires a PRV. That's the valve that's going into that building. All right. So very helpful for us. And the last thing here on the PRVs is just this. If, uh, firefighters, if you're not sure it's a PRV, you can take the cap off. The left-hand side with that threaded stem, that's not a PRV. There may be external restriction devices, PRDs on the outside of that that you have to look for, but left-hand side is a standard valve. Right-hand side has that smooth stem. You can see the pilot hole there. That is so that it can move and uh, regulate pressure, and that's some sort of internal operating PRV. All right? Now, let me move along here because I know, uh, Chris, you want to move a little bit with time. This is important right here. Um, you cut a PRV in half and you cut a automatic combination nozzle in half, you'll see that they have a lot of the same components. And that is why we, we are huge advocates for firefighters not to utilize automatic combination nozzles, especially for uh, standpipe operations, because you could be hooked up to a PRV, uh, especially if you have a medium diameter hose line and then you have a PRV nozzle, that could be a problem for you for sure. The document with a lot of the information in it is NFPA 14, and there's specifics in there that we won't go into tonight, but I'd be happy to answer any questions with regard to what you might have for that. These are the, you know, the bodies in the American Fire Service that recommend the use of two and a half for standpipe operations, NFPA, uh, FEMA, and United States Fire Administration. Um, so, so that's out there. All right. Now, um, Chris, I'm kind of moving into some hose stuff here for us, but because I knew that part of the discussion tonight would want to piggyback on what we originally did in Minnesota with regard to comparing inch and three quarter and, and two and a half. And so um, colleagues and, and, and friends and trusted associates and top shelf firefighters that, I, that I'm fortunate to work with on my job went out and actually flow tested, comparing 
inch and three quarter, two inch, two and a half. Um, they, they used pressures of 40 PSI, similar to one Meridian Plaza, 65 PSI, which mirrors NFPA 14 for buildings pre-1993, 100 PSI, which uh, is for buildings NFPA 14 post-1993. So those are some of the criteria that they used with regard to this, okay? Uh, the stretches were 150, 200, and 250, not untypical standpipe um, hose line stretches. All right, so with that, um, we we wanted to say, okay, what what's the criteria here that we're we're wanting to shoot for? And the criteria we, we shot for is, is is that that I think is the nationally accepted standard of practice across the fire service, and that is for a residential occupancy you should be able to achieve a minimum of 150 GPM from the first attack hose line. For a commercial occupancy, 250 GPM from uh, the first attack hose line. All right. Now, with all that said, they did the flows, and here's some of the conclusions. Um, in that first um, grouping there on that, that spreadsheet that we have for inch and three quarter, um, for residential occupancy, we're, we're, we're looking to get that 150 GPM, okay? 44% of the time, uh, inch and three quarter was able to achieve um, the, uh, the minimum of 150. Uh, for the two inch, 66% of the time, two inch was able to achieve that minimum uh, 150 GPM. And then the two and a half was able to achieve the, the minimum 150 GPM 100% of the time. Now, residential occupancy here. And now, for these tests, we used a specific brand of two and a half, a specific brand of, of two inch, a specific brand of inch and three quarter. I, I understand that you may have a different brand of hose out there and you may get some slightly different numbers, but I'll, I'll bet you a, a month wages that your, your numbers that you would get with the hose that you have in your jurisdiction is gonna be very close to the All right, Dave. Looks like we might have lost him. I think a good point, Jerry, to transition here while we wait for him to come back is um, talking about this new tip, right? Because I think this ties into the choke tip thing. And uh, it's something we've noticed here lately uh, that's become a lot more popular and we're getting a lot more questions on is that's this tip here where you have a, uh, we just came out with this tip. We're going to have it at FDIC. Uh, it's an ST184 XD is the model. We'll wait for Dave to jump back on here. I think it looks like he had a bad stream. Um, but anyway, what we have here is a base inch and eighth tip, okay, which would be very common, standard 265 gallon a minute, around 250 GPM flows, what the, the system is rated for. And then if you have that lower pressure situation, right, going and screwing on a smaller tip, in this case, a one inch tip, will choke that down, give you some back pressure and give you the ability to increase your reach based on the available water supply, but still have a smooth bore nozzle to do it. There's a lot more fire departments running two inch hose, maybe a two inch lead length. And in particular, where this was born was two and a quarter, which is also a new hose size, right? where we have this um, one inch tip that can be used as a choke tip. The nice part is this can be left in your bag if you're running two and a half. It's got internal threads on it. Where's my camera? It's got internal threads on it. So that way they won't get damaged. You can leave this in the bag, screw it on when you need to. Jerry, you wanna talk a little bit more about uh, the choke tip concept? Uh, yeah. And I'm gonna get Dave back on here. So thanks for bearing with us. So the, the, the whole choke tip uh, concept is uh, applies for a couple of different things. Um, that particular model that we just made there, that thread can also be adapted to the old, if you, you refer to the FDNY stack, which had an inch and an eighth uh, primary attack stream with a half inch outside tip, which is basically an overhaul tip, a 50 GPM tip. Yeah. Um, the whole concept of, of choking down, and, and we've seen this uh, recently, is, is some departments uh, did inventories of their building stock, right? So they've recognized where they have pre-93 and post-93 and wanted to build a stack that would accommodate either extreme. 
or either extreme. So uh, we've seen some do an inch and an eighth with a 15 16 inch and three sixteenths with a 15 16 um, That that works because it addresses specific building system targets. Um, the other big advantage of a choke tip is if, uh, let's say you're doing it right, you're pulling, you know, two and a half and you get down and it's not a large body of fire, it's an overhaul type situation. You now have the ability to go down to something which is a much lesser flow. Some people are carrying, you know, uh, even like a, um, a wild land fog nozzle or something like that, you know, for overhaul yeah. mattress fire, that type of a thing. But the other thing, and, and Chief McGrail brought this up earlier, if you're in a situation and you, you scratch off the pipe and the pipe is giving you a marginal supply and you have a heavy body of fire. So you, you may have volume, but you don't have reach. So a choke tip is going to give you the ability to choke down to a smaller hole, give you more reach, at least start to get something down range to temper the fire so you can move into the position where the volume can reach it. So that's the whole concept. And, you know, there's not one size that's going to be right for everybody. It should be pre cloning your systems. And, and if you have both pre-93 and post-93, um, get the smooth board tips that ideally on a good day are going to give you the flow that you want. But consider having that option to choke down to something that gives you the ability to put water down range, regardless of what the system may supply for you on a bad day. Welcome back, Chief. I'm sorry about that, guys. I don't know. There must be some gremlins around here or something like that. Yeah, that's, that. the, that's the problem with being live. All right. So uh, we're we're working up the system, right? Uh, we, we've, we've covered intake FTC. Um, people, we've encouraged, if you want to go deeper on valve identification, uh, the brass tacks, hard facts, uh, has videos out of overcome and identify um so let's let's get up to the uh to the hookup dave let's let's get up to the fire the floor below and the fire floor again I'll, we'll talk about hose and and one we lost you again dave no audio no audio. hold on hey dave sorry everybody out there in tv land dave we're getting some feedback from you somehow so i think the second computer with the slides on it um okay. you just make sure that's Turned all the way down or, or mute it somehow. I can't mute it from my end. Okay. How do you hear me now? Oh, uh, can hear you okay now. Okay, is that is that okay? Yes. Okay. Uh sorry about that. Um okay. we're still okay. All right, let me know if that goes bad again, Chris. Um I've got the echo, Jerry. Have... Do you have an echo? Uh you're you're echoing, Chris. Dave is not. Okay. Okay, so All right, just, cool. just wanted to do a quick shout out to uh, uh, Chief Tracy Rayner up in Valdez, Alaska. He is uh, one of my best friends in the fire service. He's just a top shelf guy, and I believe he's on with us tonight. And a uh, guy that's been doing this for over 40 years now, and he's he's still engaged in fire chiefs, fire chief, firemen's fire chief for sure. Um, I, I'm just going to throw out some recommendations here. Uh, from your brother from Denver, and my recommendations are these. I believe that using anything less than two inch for a standpipe operation is dangerous and foolish. Um, I believe that the two inch uh, is is primarily going to be a better, not a better, but the hose line that you would want to be thinking about using, but only if it's a residential occupancy. Now, um, once again, residential occupancy, stay away from the commercial. If you have something going on in a uh, commercial building, I think that your minimum size attack line should be two and a half. Now, based on what we learned, certainly from, from FDMY and from Ray, Jerry and Chris, um, our good friend Ray, I believe that that probably one of the best answers on this whole discussion is, is not necessarily two and a half or two inch, but a combination of both of them. And I think that you can have really good success with with a, a two inch nozzle section and a, um, a, a two and a half inch hose feeding that nozzle section off the standpipe because now you may be able to achieve your maneuverability and you might be able to, uh, you know, hopefully you'll be able to overcome the low pressure situation as well. So, um, and that might have gone away again with regard to that. Uh, there it is uh, back again. Okay. Good All right. Sorry about the echo. We found the magic button. 
Uh, Dave, Dave brings up a, 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 a very good point there. And, and what he's talking about is, is running that, that intermediate uh, size as the lead length. And, and other urban cities have tried that it, and uh, are in, in the process of evaluating it now. So two and a half is still the default, um, obviously on a commercial fire, but from a mobility standpoint or a compromise supply standpoint, that lead length of an intermediate hose size would be just the working length that's going into the residential compartment. So the photo here uh, just shows four sections of two and a half with the Elkhart standpipe kit, with all the goodies inside. Obviously, one of the sections has got the nozzle pre-attached. That's going to be, you know, that's going to reduce a little bit of that reflex time of getting in service and going to work. Um, an option that I've seen that's out there, although the colleagues, the trusted colleagues and the top shelf guys that I talk to are drifting a little bit away from this option, is to have, of the four hose packs, one of them is the, the regular nozzle hose pack, but another nozzle hose pack with an increaser, an inch and a half to two and a half inch increaser on that. And in the photo, that would be the one closest to you in the photo, I guess, left-hand side. But that is so that you could extend the hose line. That's just an option to think about there. Um, everything we would need to extend a hose line is there in that one-piece pack. Uh, the increaser, which we can hook up to that break-apart nozzle off of the original tack line, the hose itself, the nozzle, so forth. Now... Right now, uh, where I'm at and uh, based on what I'm seeing and based on my own beliefs and my own experience, I think this is a real sweet spot and a good place for firefighters, fire departments, engine companies to be. And my primary recommendation is five sections of hose, 50 foot lengths. Four of the sections are two and a half. One of them has a nozzle pre-attached and then a fifth section of two inch with a nozzle pre-attached. And um, one inch tip on that, we could be using the new tip that uh, Chris was talking to me about tonight. I think you were talking about that when I dropped offline there for a second. Yeah, Chris, but there. Well, it's kind of the best of both worlds. If you can leave the one inch on if you're rolling with the two inch lead length, or you can take the tip off, leave it in the bag if you're rolling the, um, the two and a half, kind of two in one deal. Yep. Absolutely. Another good point here, just uh, actually uh, another good buddy, uh, Mike Turpak, just brought this up. Your two and a half should be two and a half inch coupling. So you're using the exact same nozzle setup that you had with a two and a half. You're just going to a different tip size on the lead length. If you have a default back to a two and a half, you can. The coupling size, you won't, you won't need to adapt to it. Absolutely. I, Mike Turpak, thank you for being on here tonight. You're you're one of the greaters a mentor and a friend in the, in the fire service. Thank you for being on here. And, and absolutely, Chief Turpak, you're right. Um, two and a half inch couplings on that two inch hose is ideal. And this particular particular photograph does have that uh, two inch with two and a half inch coupling. So sweet spot for you, uh, so on and so forth. So let me just uh, see where I'm at here. Um, hey, Dave, one of, one of the questions uh, that I want to make sure we don't miss, because a couple of people have asked it now. Uh, is uh, pumping the FPC and you know as a fire pump. Did you understand that, Jerry? Uh, Chris yeah, kind of broke up. I didn't completely understand it. Address how you would pump an FDC on a system that has a fire pump. Okay. It's a very good question. And this came from Michael. Yep. Mike, Michael, Michael, thank you yep. for being uh, with us tonight. It's a great question. How would we pump a, a standpipe system? that has a built-in fire pump. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let's see here. Um, Michael, my recommendation, your recommendation from your brother in Denver, um, and this, this might seem kind of absurd, but this is my recommendation to you. When we respond, um, put your mindset in a place that believes the building doesn't have a fire pump. Okay? Uh, put your mindset in a place that believes the building doesn't have sprinklers. If it has sprinklers and they're working and they've contained the fire, great. We'll go in there, we'll, we'll stretch our line, do our searches uh, and, and, and complete the operation, check for extension, so on and so forth. Uh, if it has a, a building fire pump and it's working and uh, the engine company gets up there and is able to stretch line and uh, you know charge that line from the hose valve outlet and get water and it happens to be good water from the building's fire pump, and during that process, our engineers and our pump operators outside are preparing to 
to to uh, stretch and supply the system. If the fire pump works, great. Pretend it doesn't exist. And my recommendation is to supply the standpipe system, supply it from our pumpers with water from our hydrants, from our pumps, from our hose, and, and pressurize that system uh, appropriately as if we were supplying it and there was no fire pump. Now, some things that are out there and a, a very knowledgeable guy that I learned something new from him every time I see him is the good professor Dennis Laguerre, a retired captain from the Oakland Fire Department. And, and Dennis has helped me out on a lot of this stuff. Many, over the course of time, and there may be firefighters with us tonight that have heard this, um, we're going to pump the system with our pumpers because we want to augment the building's fire pump. What we now know today is it's either the building's fire pump or it's us, okay? Whichever pressure is higher, that's that's who's going to be actually feeding the system, one or the other. You're not augmenting one or the other. Whichever one you're not using, you want to shut it off, though, before it burns up. So I'm hoping I'm answering that correctly for you, Michael. Whether the building has a fire pump or not, don't trust it. Don't don't trust it as if it exists. If it works, fantastic. That, that's great. But in the process of us going to work, supply the system. Supply it from our pumpers. Have those engineers put the pressure in there that will be appropriate for the given situation. And then this is another oddball one that I learned from Professor Dennis Laguerre. We get out of a fire on the sixth floor of that high-rise building that I previously showed, the 50-story building with PRVs. Fire on the sixth floor, if it's got PRVs, what we now understand today is we're supposed to supply the entire system in order for the PRVs to operate properly versus a system without PRVs where we say fires on the sixth floor, I'm going to... I'm going to pump to the fifth floor, the, essentially the, the ceiling, if you will, of uh, the, uh, the fifth floor. So I hope that answers the question. Did I answer that sufficiently, Jerry and Chris, or did I just? Yeah, yeah, you sure yeah I think you did. And thanks, thanks, Mike. That was a great question. Um, real quick, uh, uh, Greg, I, Greg Raymond had a question on there on the increaser that you discussed. Uh, Greg, I shot you an IM, but maybe you didn't get it. Uh, I'll just cover it real quickly. The increaser gives the ability to go from inch and a half to two and a half extension off the leader thread on the outlet of the nozzle without having to compromise or shut down. So you basically close the bale, you can put that increaser on and couple two and a half inch hose to the outlet thread on the nozzle. And so it was, what was that firefighter's name, Jerry, with the increaser? Uh, Greg Raymond. So Greg, uh, increaser is a very, uh, it's a very cheap piece of equipment and it's, it's, is a very valuable piece of equipment. Um, you can reach out to these guys. We can give you additional information offline on that if you'd like. Um, let's see here. Oh, people go to see. Okay. Yep, we, we can talk more about that offline too if you'd like, Greg, for sure. The the photo that I've got up there, guys, and, and, and Jerry, we've talked about a proper size hose. Uh, Chris, um, flushing the hose valve outlet is, is a hallmark of our standpipe operation. Um, I, I, one of the guarantees that I'll give you is that when you hook up to a hose valve outlet, the standpipe is likely going to have dirty, nasty, stinky water in it. There's going to be rust, debris, sediment, and who knows what else in the system. When we, when we start that flush on the floor below with our control firefighter, number one, we're trying to ident identify, is there water in the system? <laughs> okay. Uh, number two, we're trying to identify, does it appear to be does it appear to have some pressure to it? Both very good things for sure. And flushing it, uh, we're not we're not always going to not. We, there may still be things left in the system. This flushing is once again identifying if it's actually working and trying to get some of the significant big chunks out of there before we hook up to it. The flushing on the 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 hose valve outlet end and then the smoothbore nozzle on the business end of our fire attack are the two principal components associated with trying not to clog up a nozzle and trying not to clog up an attack hose line. And that's the primary reason why we recommend smoothbore nozzle for this standpipe operation attack is the debris. And the second part of that certainly is a much deeper topic and a deeper subject with regard to steam and, and so on and so forth. Um, where we're hooking up, and, and Jerry, you and Chris have done very good work on this with regard to videos and so forth. It's 
to my brothers and sisters out there, it's it's going to be very difficult to convince firefighters and especially the decision makers in your organization that you need to buy a valve so that you can put it on a valve. Okay. Um, there's the additional weight that's going to be in the kit, which I don't think is significant. I think any of us uh, are going to be able to do that and so on and so forth. But uh, it is really important to, to, to get this valve. And, and the one that I recommend and the one that I like is the one in the photo, that Alcart um, gate valve. Because a couple of things here for you. One of the things that I've found, and I think you've probably found the same thing in your experience, is that sometimes it's difficult to open up that hose valve outlet because it's never been opened before. Uh, once we get it open, sometimes it's very difficult to, to, to regulate pressure because it doesn't move very easily. So the recommendation, you can see the red gate valve there, the red Alcart gate valve, put that on there, make sure it's closed, fully open the, uh, the, the building's hose valve outlet and then leave it fully open and all of your regulations and pressure adjustments and that sort of thing can now be used with your valve, which is a, a smooth operating, you know, Alcart gate valve. So that, that's on the, on the front end of this operation, one of the recommendations. Now, let me back up here just a little bit. And, you know, uh, a couple of things for you and Chris and Jerry, you'll have to let me know how deep you want to go into some of this stuff, but certainly uh, apartment stretch is going to be our most frequent stretch. Uh, stretching to, to, to an apartment where we believe we have a fire that is in a compartmentized area. And our ability to stretch a dry line up to that point of operation is based on the fact that that door is closed and we have control of the door. Now, it depends on your department policies and that sort of thing. In my system, there's likely going to be a truck company there. Uh, it may be that the truck company, uh, which would be uh, you know officer and two firefighters, have entered the apartment with a can, thermal imager, uh, tool, so on and so forth. Uh, maybe they're going to see if they can identify the location. Maybe it's a mattress that's going and they can knock it down with a can, whatever the case may be. But our ability to stretch dry in this fire floor hallway is based on somebody on our team. In my system, it would be a truck company that has control of a closed door. The positions that I recommend for you here if we were to look at this from above, if that was a compartmentized fire apartment in a you know, typical residential building in your city or mine, fire attack team will call it engine one who arrived there first. Remember their engineer, their, their, the fourth of that team is outside pumping the system. Okay, uh, engine one company officer, the nozzle firefighter, the backup firefighter in actually attacking that fire in the apartment. In our system, there's likely gonna be three from a truck company in there as well. And in a lot of apartments, that's about as many firefighters as you want to stuff in there. Uh, at the door to that fire apartment, I believe the best person for that position is going to be the company officer from engine two, uh, because now they can kind of control that door in terms of flow path and wind impact. Now, obviously, they're not going to be able to close it. There's a hose line that goes through there. Any firefighters with low air warning, any firefighters that have a May Day, an emergency as they come out, that engine two company officer at the door can guide them uh, to his, you know, the, the, the safe way to, to, to get out of that area, direct them to where the hose is, get their hands on the hose, so on and so forth. Engine two firefighter, one of the two engine two firefighters at the stairwell door. Once again, controlling that door, controlling flow if necessary. And then if necessary, they can, <coughs> you know, give additional line if you need it up on the fire floor. And then in this cutaway, it would show the cross view of the building, which gives us our third firefighter um, or our, our sixth member of this fire attack. And that would be the firefighter from engine two that's at the hose valve outlet. And that's our control firefighter that's regulating the pressure. So I use the, the number three uh, because I work in a system that has minimum staffing of four. Engineers are outside that takes us down to three and three. And one of the hallmarks to be successful with the uh, uh, two and a half inch standpipe operations and really any hose line because of the, the turns you have to make and hooking up on the floor below. If you marry engine one and engine two together or your first two arriving engine companies, regardless of their number designation, uh, and they're focusing on putting one powerful attack hose line in service, that is a huge part of our success at these type of operations. Chris and Jerry, where do you want to go from here? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, one thing that came up earlier, Dave, 
Um, <clears throat> it's obviously, it, it, we're, we're all familiar with hooking up on the floor below, um, regardless whether you have a clean hall or dirty hall on the fire floor. Uh, question came up earlier, where would the second line come from? Would it be two floors below? What what is what are your thoughts on that? And, it, and it's a great question. And the guideline answer would be this: the two floors below is where we'd like to like you to come from. That's the safest thing to do. Now, once again, I work in a city where most of the hose valve outlets in most of the buildings that are older buildings, um, those hose valve outlets are in cabinets in the hallways. A brand new building built in, in my city today is going to have um, hose valve outlets in the stairwell, which is the place where I would prefer that they would be, um, so forth. If you have hose valve outlets in a stairwell, I don't think you can discount the, the possibility of using the fire floor hose valve outlet. I don't think you can completely discount that, but that's certainly not going to be the first choice. And there's a variety of reasons for that, because... Once we start this fire attack, the hallway is going to fill with smoke. The stairwell is going to get filled with smoke. You're, you're going to be in a position where if uh, you're hooked up on the fire floor, even if it's the landing inside the stairwell, that control firefighter is probably going to have to go on air, and they might not be able to see the, the, the gauge to actually regulate pressure. So the answer and the recommendation is two floors below for a backup line, okay, same stairwell because we want to establish a fire attack stairwell, we want to leave the other stairwell as an evacuation stairwell and maintain that if possible. That's the answer, and that's what we'd like to do. But I do want to throw it out there that, you know, one of the one of the best lines in John Norman's book, Fire Officer's Handbook of Tactics, is let circumstances dictate procedures. And I I, I am a procedural guy, and I, I like to see us do things a certain way, and especially with elevator discipline and never taking an elevator to a fire floor or reported floor of alarm, that sort of thing. But there are some things where, where in, in this situation, we've got to do this, and this is the reason why. So leave that available. But if you can, the best answer and the best option and the safest thing to do is to hook up the backup line two floors below the fire floor. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. All right, so we're, we're kind of winding down here. Um, we started, obviously, on the supply side, uh, the FTC, overcoming the FTC. Uh, we've got resources uh, that go deep into valve identification and overcoming them if they can be overcome. Um, I appreciate everybody that's on the feed. Some of the questions that were brought up or answered in the feed. Uh, we wish we could have got to every single question. It's just not realistic. Uh, I haven't seen our numbers, but I, I know we've got a lot of people on right now. Um, Dave, I, I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, we're, we're on subject matter where we could go for days talking about this, obviously. Any, any piece of it would, would be a class in itself. And I think there's there's the nugget is uh, for people that are listening, get 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 out, get to an ATROC, get to an FDIC uh, where someone with the caliber of Chief McGrail is presenting. Um, take the segments of the attack system just like you would do for a ground level operation. You have to anticipate failure, um, equip yourself. Uh, you know, here's the simple analogy. It, it's not like being at a story and a half wood frame where you forget something and you got a 25 foot setback to the rig to get it. If, if you're on the 27th floor and it's not in a little bag, you don't have it. So forethought and pre-planning is, is absolutely essential. And, and chief, that's where you started. You, you know, you learned lessons at a fire years ago, um, that made you start going deeper into the evaluation of anticipating that you're going to get a problem. Uh, it, it, that gold advice, uh, in your experience, is an 80% problem rate, not even a total system failure, but anticipate the system is not going to give you what it was designed to. Uh, that's probably uh, what the, 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 the most critical thing I've taken out of this entire thing. Um, we will try and get to the questions that were thrown up that we didn't address, uh, and we'll ask Dave to, to take a look at those, uh, if not tonight, tomorrow, that'll, they'll, they'll be on our Facebook page. Um, all the questions do get up, a uh, tremendous amount of impact tonight, uh, and a tremendous amount of interaction with, uh, with the people that are watching. We really appreciate it. Dave, um, we had a few people ask too, um, and we always kind of wrap like, you know, where can we find you? Obviously. You have your book up there. We, we highly recommend that. Um, a lot of accolades for that piece. Um, 
and you're at Atrock every year. Um, if you want to talk about that or maybe where else we can find you. And if anybody has maybe even direct questions, if you'd be willing to share your, your contact info, your website with them. Absolutely. Uh, McGrail Fire Ops is, is a website. Um, first name McGrail, last name Fire Ops on Facebook. And then uh, my email address, dmcgrail, Denver FD. It's all one word, and the FD as in fire department, but just the letters, McGrail, Denver FD at msn.com is my personal email, and I'd, I'd be happy to help out any of the, the firefighters. Uh, um, Jerry and Chris, thank you. I'm, I'm flattered and honored that you guys would invite me to be a part of this. I want to thank you guys for, for what you're doing as ambassadors you know, in this fire service, both as firefighters and as um, you know, people that make a very good product that we use to, to attack fires. And then last but not least, is very grateful, and, and it does my heart a lot of good when I see so many uh, dedicated firefighters that are engaged in, in our profession and, and they're with us tonight. So uh, thank all of you great firefighters be, for being with us tonight. Um, we'll, post Dave's, um, we'll post Dave's email in there. I put the website up um, in the comments. I appreciate uh, that. I appreciate um, Dave and Jerry for jumping on tonight and uh, sharing some great knowledge with us. Um, uh, as usual, we put up the site here. You can find everything at BrassTaxHardFacts.com. That's right. Water always wins. Don't forget that. Um, at, or ElkhartBrass.com for any kind of technical info. See what's new. We are on all the socials. You can always find us on social media. And um, again, we are proud to be part of the Safe Fleet uh, uh, group. We are in the fire uh, EMS and industrial group made up of FRC, does your lighting, your governors, your displays, foam pro, your foam proportioner systems, um, ourselves and ROM that make the roll up doors. So um, we are all grouped together in a, in a great um, group and family. And you can find all of our stuff at safefleet.net slash FEI. So if you're out specking a rig, check out the site. You'll be able to see what's new. Um, get a hold of somebody and link to every website. So again, everybody, thanks for tuning in. We'll have this up on YouTube tomorrow. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you next Wednesday night. Good night, everybody.